Hey there, scabby scummers and gangers. Crimson Oracle here with yet another video on the terrain projects that I've been working on as part of my Battlefield on a Budget series. Uh, for this video, I delve into the world of aluminum can terrain uh, for the first time, but surely not the last. I, in this case, uh, am doing vertical terrain similar to what the Sector Mechanicus terrain looks like. Uh, it's a little bit taller than the uh, Pringles can train that we did in the last video. Um, I really like how this one turned out. Um, I know not everyone is a fan of using, you know, these kinds of materials in their builds, uh, but I think that they can be a lot of fun. And uh, more importantly, they are readily available and they're going to get thrown away otherwise. So I'm happy to employ them in my builds. Uh, in the meanwhile, um, I have been working on trying to get a regular content of various kinds out on this channel, and I'm pretty happy with how things are going so far. Um, please, of course, like and subscribe. I know that it's cliche to ask, but, uh, you know, that's kind of how uh, the world works. You have to ask for stuff like that, um, and people will follow through. So I appreciate everyone who's followed so far. Uh, I don't want to, you know, harp on it too much, uh, cause I know it can be annoying, but, uh, you know, it's just is what it is. I am super happy to be, uh, getting into further into this series. Uh, I believe next week what I'll be doing as part of the battlefield and the budget will be, uh, scatter terrain, uh, stuff that is single level, uh, lower to the ground partially blocks line of sight, that kind of thing. So uh, you'll see a few different techniques that I use there. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, getting into all the different stuff that I have planned uh, for this series and for other things for this channel. Uh, so please, uh, you know, stick around. Uh, there's lots of fun yet to come. So we're starting with a soda can here using the same cardboard base technique uh, from the previous tutorial. Uh, I am going extremely slowly here, obviously, and fast forwarding, but please be very careful if you are ever uh, trying to cut like that. I was not being as diligent as I should be. Uh, it wasn't quite cutting towards myself, but, you know, you just have to be careful. Uh, so much like the previous tutorial, uh, the can has been super glued down onto the cardboard. The cardboard has been super glued to each other. Uh, cut to form a beveled edge, and then I come through with the wood filler and give it that nice, heavy, solid base structure uh, and decent texture. And of course, for the levels, I'm going to use more cardboard. Uh, now, generally speaking, I prefer foam core for making levels, um, but the cardboard it has been something I've been experimenting with more recently because I don't uh, want to spend any money on materials for this if I can avoid it. Uh, so I have been literally just harvesting cardboard from the stuff that comes into my house, uh, and I find it's working really well. So uh, I'm just going to keep using it, even though personally I prefer foam core. Uh, I think that you know, either works foam core, you'll get slightly more, uh, weight to the, you know, to the thickness of it. Uh, but there is, I find in my experience, a little bit more risk of warpage, uh, with the foam core than I've experienced with this nice corrugated cardboard. Um, now what's cool about this terrain is that the cans are, very, very similar in height to the sector uh, Mechanicus terrain that Games Workshop sells and which apparently just went on uh, last chance to buy. So if you happen to use that terrain, this stuff will work really well next to it. It's not a perfect match. You would need to do a little more diligent effort to space it out. Uh, but with a couple of layers of cardboard, you can get the effect of having the exact same height terrain. Uh, in fact, in the past, I actually did the exact shapes of the Sector Mechanicus terrain with the foam core I was using, and that allowed me to get a very similar 
a very similar feel and mix that stuff together. Uh, as you just saw, I used a, a piece of cardboard as kind of a, a jig to make sure that the two pieces uh, will fit flush together. And now here, this is something I've been trying to do with these builds, which is I am using the uh, junk that I find around my house. Here, for example, a push pop lid. Uh, if you have the uh, any children, uh, they probably enjoy weird, you know, candies that have plastic components. And guess what? You can integrate those plastic components into your build instead of throwing them away. And these will form the basis of some uh, pipes that are coming off of the cans, which give them more of a feeling of industrial purpose. Why these tanks exist, you know, who knows? Some kind of storage but they have a, a, an outlet pipe. Now, down at the bottom, I am trying to break up the texture of the can a little bit, give it a little bit of a, a you know interesting visual uh, component that is a little bit different uh, from the actual shape of the can itself. So I am putting some toothpicks that I've cut down to size along the edge, and then I'm going to put a piece of the corrugated paper across them and that kind of gives the feel of something that's been you know patched or repaired or fortified or maybe the exterior has been damaged in some way uh and that that sort of structure is is showing through from you know some previous industrial component and uh, i think it it really uh, adds a little bit of interest visual interest to add chunks of cardboard uh, this, uh, you know, this cereal box material material that I'm using and and the uh, various uh, sheets of corrugated card or corrugated paper uh, and just go through and, you know, add all these different elements. And I find that it breaks up the piece and it makes it look less like you're looking at just a tin can and more like you're looking at some kind of, you know, heavily reused and modified uh, industrial equipment. So I like to do these kind of little bits. Uh, they take a little bit more time. And obviously, if you are in a rush, you could just slap some cans down on some cardboard and call it a day. But uh, I think that you get a, a pretty good return on the time investment by just spending a little bit of extra uh, gluing all this down, especially if you use accelerant. Uh, with your super glue, it will seriously speed up your dry times and give you, you know, a, a lot more out of your project. And of course, uh, I use super glue here because uh, that's one of the only ways you can get stuff to stick to metal. You could use hot glue, uh, but I find that hot glue can be kind of fragile, especially when you're dealing with something like an aluminum can where there's some flex to it. Uh, the hot glue can be used definitely around the rim at the bottom. Uh, I find that it works pretty well for that because the rim is sort of doubled over on the aluminum cans and a lot more sturdy. Uh, but super glue really works best when you're dealing with the sides of a can because uh, it, it dries nice and solid. And as you can see, it takes sometimes a little bit of effort if you happen to, like me, be out of accelerant at any given time. And so I come in and do the uh, rest of the detailing and greebling. Uh, the term greebling actually is really interesting. If you don't know, uh, greebles refer to the little bits of detail, uh, the, the tiny components that don't necessarily have a purpose that you add to a build in order to give it the appearance of more detail and depth. The term is actually apparently coined by George Lucas, of all people, uh, when they were working on the various models for Star Wars. Uh, the importance of having those small textured details that give the appearance of more to the ship uh, was something that uh, George Lucas was very uh, picky about. And so he coined the term and it has become something of a, a term of art ever since. Um, as you can see here, I'm coming in once again with the little circular nail beads and 
putting uh, rivets on each of the little bits of cardboard. Uh, these will give, you know, appearance of texture and depth. And uh, a lot of them won't even be super visible when you come back over with the texture paste. Uh, but of course, you know, you know they're there. And when you look closely and you see details like rivets underneath all of the grime and muck that goes on top, uh, it makes the object appear more realistic um, than if you had just put the texture paint on top. But of course, you can get away with skipping this step if you're in a hurry. Personally, I like to do a little bit of extra to give it that kind of lived in feel. Next up, we are going to be using some uh, wooden materials that are cheap and readily accessible and which I keep in large quantities uh, to make some ladders. So in this case, I am starting with some popsicle sticks. I actually think that the thicker tongue depressors work slightly better for this, but you know, you have what you have. So uh, because of the height of the this build, I am going to cut down uh, three popsicle sticks to give me a bit that is enough, uh, tall enough. And then I'm going to use the leftovers from the last one. Oh, don't cut towards yourself. Uh, please ignore me being irresponsible. Um, and then I will use the leftovers to uh, glue and brace the backs of these pieces coming together and super glue those. And again, accelerant is your friend. If you are trying to go quickly, uh, I strongly recommend getting yourself a little bit of uh, the accelerant for super glue, if that's what you're using. And of course, I'm going to use the toothpicks to make rungs, cutting these down. Uh, because this is a sort of very dingy, worn down sort of build. I am not going for precision here. You know, these pieces are are not meant to be uh, super duper uh, neat with very clean lines. Part of the goal is to make something that looks very ramshackle. So uh, the ladder is, you know, going up in kind of a haphazard fashion. And I'm visually kind of spacing them out similar heights or whatever, but I am not being careful to follow a grid or measurement. But if you wanted to do that, it would be very easy to make a jig uh, from, a say, a piece of plastic card rod or even just use a uh, you know a metal ruler to get your pieces all the exact height. Uh, same length, and then you could go go along with a ruler on your uh, ladder and mark evenly spaced rungs. But I'm happy with this sort of uh, hot cobbled together kind of look, and so I glue it in all of the points of contact. Again, I wish I had had accelerant; it would have gone faster. Um, but I wound up just leaving it here to dry for a little bit after making sure that all of the points of contact glued. And of course, next up, we're going to use the texture paste that I showed how to make in the first episode of this series. And we're going to come through and apply it to all of the surfaces, uh, thicker on the ground level where grit tends to settle. Uh, but it really represents both sort of environmental grit and the sort of... Uh, rusty, messy kind of look that you can get uh, when metal starts to corrode. Uh, I always make a point of coming around onto the bottoms of the various platforms. Uh, they don't always get detailed when people work on their builds. And I find that having that little bit of detail is really nice for if you're taking a photograph uh, that is a, sort of a low angle and you find yourself catching underneath of your build as part of you know a, a shot in the battle of the battlefield when you're gaming it gives it more of a feel of a real sort of uh, a real object that that has you know 3d depth so I make sure to get all of that uh, I also get all of the uh, surfaces. You remember, you're trying to get the glue 
the PVA inside of the material to harden the uh, corrugated paper for you. Uh, now, I, of course, use an airbrush because I don't want to deal with the humidity outside uh, when it comes to priming, but you could easily do the priming for this build with a rattle can, uh, and that was how I did it for years before I got an airbrush, and everything else in this build is something you can do without an airbrush, as I'm trying to do for all of my builds. And, of course, we come through with a spray of white over the top, at the end and now we're going to come in with a brown craft paint and i uh, make sure to water that down with some flow improver and some water to give it uh you know a nice uh flow so that it goes over this project very quickly obviously this could be done with a brown rattle can paint um i definitely would consider doing that if I was doing a ton of terrain because it's going to wind up being even cheaper than doing the brown uh, from the craft paint line, which is already very inexpensive. So if you're trying to save money, I do find that getting a like brown auto primer will give you a better uh, coverage for your dollar over something like this while also going a little bit faster. Uh, but I don't generally like putting that brown uh, craft paint through my airbrush if I can avoid it. Uh, so I did this the slightly longer, more manual way. Uh, you know, I often will use a brown ink for this kind of task. Um, but then you have to seal the ink afterward. And I just didn't want to get into that with these steps. Now I'm going to use a bit of tan mixed with the brown to make the bottom layer uh, kind of a darker white. I'm going to come in with an orange. Uh, this is a Pueblo from Folk Art. And I like to do just a glopping of it all over the place. So we're going to do a lot of detail over, over top. So go rough with it. <laughs> so I, I'm doing a silver over top. Uh, I'm using the brush, but it's a, a rough brush and I'm just sort of using it the way I would use a sponge. And now I'm coming in with a black wash that I make by mixing medium and ink and flow improver. You could use Nuln Oil or the Vallejo uh, oil spill paint if you don't want to deal with making your own wash. I will do an episode on making your own washes in the future when I need more. I'm kind of stocked at the moment. And of course, I do the base as well to darken that up. And now while the paint is wet, while the wash is wet, I come in with some weathering pigments from Vallejo. Uh, in this case, it is European earth and desert dust. And that allows me to come in and give that sort of uh, ashy, messy kind of feel. Now you could call the build done here, but I am going to come in with a purple uh, from Vallejo and use a sponge to apply it over the sort of surface of the tank itself. Now this is what I would characterize as adding paint remnants. So there's kind of two different approaches to adding a paint that has been worn down on a model. One is to cover the whole area that used to be uh, that, that color and then use either a salt weathering or a uh, chipping medium to remove the layer of the paint that's on top. This gives you a nice organic kind of look. Uh, but if you are in a hurry, if you don't want to have to deal with masking and spraying paint down, I definitely recommend just using a sponge because it can give you a very similar sort of organic feel without requiring the same level of uh, effort. And, it, uh, you know, it's a little bit more work to do the salt technique, which I will show uh, in an upcoming video as well. But uh, this is the fast and easy way to do it. Now, I'm going to come through with another layer of the purple. This time, uh, it's a 
It's a cer ceramo coat uh, acrylic paint. It's just another cheap craft paint uh, passion color. Highlighting your remnants gives them more of a feeling of depth and being an actual coat of paint in terms of how it hits the eyes of the person who is viewing them. And then we're going to actually come over on top and add yet another layer of weathering that will sort of blend this a little bit better. So now we're going to come in with some black with the sponge once again, and that will give the appearance that some of the paint has been weathered away, even in the spots where you added it. And then we come in with a brown, do much the same. And finally, an orange. And as you can see, it integrates well. And a little bit of silver. Now with the silver, make sure you're hitting edges because even rusty parts, when they encounter uh, friction, will weather. And of course, I would recommend coming in with a coat of varnish after all of this. Uh, you can get a can of spray varnish or you can use a paint on varnish uh, like you get at the craft store. I find that that helps to uh, give you a nice finished look. And there you have it. With just a little bit of effort, you can turn some trash into a lovely stand-in for those expensive Sector Mechanicus buildings. Uh, thank you once again to my wonderful patrons who help me make these videos possible. Uh, I appreciate all of the contributions of my patrons. I'm also adding a coffee link if you want to just give me a a donation instead and of course uh, if you are interested in supporting the show yourself uh, you can sign up on patreon.com slash dome runners there you can find early releases for my podcast episodes so check that out and of course don't forget to check out the podcast itself if you have any interest in necromunda it is extensive and there's a ton of it so check it out and everyone of course stay safe don't forget to change your paint water.